So he asked a fundamental question. He said, okay, if a process of problem solving through accumulation isn't gaining the end I want, what is opposite? And that's interesting reasoning it out in his thinking. And what he came to was that he needed to reapproach his vocal loss, problem solving through a process of negation, subtraction, and deconstruction a process of taking away the unnecessary. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who is out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Bob Nickman here. And that gentleman you heard at the beginning was Michael Frederick. He is a Alexander Technique teacher and practitioner. Been doing it for many, many decades, and he is a font of knowledge in the mind-body relationship with uh, this using this technique for uh, re-education. And what that leads to is an increased awareness of unproductive habits. And those habits are usually rooted in fear, judgment, and uh, stress. So if those are things that uh, interest you in uh, not controlling your life so much, this is a great technique not just for people in the arts, but for anyone who is uh, maybe you're having some back pain. Maybe you're wishing to become more fluid in uh, presentations. Who knows? But this is a great, powerful technique, something I actually did take classes in many years ago, so I've been interested in this for a long time. What I like about it is that it, it really does lead to a looseness and a freedom to be truly creative. That's what I, I think is the most powerful part of this work. So let's listen in. This is uh, Michael Frederick. I'm so glad that you invited me up here to Ojai in your beautiful home and to talk about the Alexander Technique. I'm actually a little self-conscious about how I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to me all the time. You know, people sort of correct their posture, but I'm not posture police at all. So yes, it's not I'm, an issue. Okay. So maybe I'll just slump down on the floor in a Do fetal position if I need to. <laughs> whatever's comfortable for you. Yes. Thank you. So um, we are here to talk about the Alexander Technique, and this is something I know a little about because I told you, as I told you, I took some uh, uh, some classes in Alexander, but I think probably most people have never even heard of it or don't know what it is. So let's start with that. Right. Who was, uh, it was F.M. Alexander, correct? Yeah, F.M. Alexander. He was an Australian. Uh, a lot of people think the Alexander Technique started in the New Age movement of the 60s, but actually the Alexander work's been around since the turn of the last century. Um, it's probably the best kept secret in the performing art world. It's taught at all the major music schools, drama schools, Royal College of Music, Royal College of Drama in England, uh, uh, Juilliard School in New York, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, and so on. I taught it 10 years down at the Old Globe in San Diego in the MFA program. But it's, it, it really is known in the performing art world. But as you pointed out, a lot of people don't know about it. Um, but they're starting to wake up to it because uh, the... Uh, the baby boom generation's getting older, and they're having problems, you know, back issues and hips and so on. And Alexander Technique's really good helping people move with ease. He was a young actor. He was 24 years old. We're talking about 1894, and um, he had a real career going. But at one point, he started losing his voice, and losing your voice for an actor is the worst thing that can happen to you. So uh, he, wa he's, he didn't want to give up acting. He loved it. So he wanted to figure out how to help himself and get his voice back. So he did what anyone would do. He went to doctors for help, and they gave him throat sprays, lozenges. 
And he tried it, but it didn't work. So he went back and said, uh, what else could you recommend? And what they recommended was something very basic. They said, give your voice a rest for a couple weeks. No big pro projection from the stage. You can talk ordinary conversation, but, but really allow your voice to, to rest. And he did that. And two weeks went by, and he came to the next performance. And he went out to start acting. His voice was fine. But halfway through the show, that old familiar tickle came to his throat. And by the end of the show, he had lost his voice again. Now, a lot of people would be frustrated with that, but he actually found it quite interesting. His thinking went like this. My voice was good at the beginning of my acting. I'd lost it at the end. Must have been something I was doing to myself. Yeah. That caused a problem. That's a revolutionary idea because in working with actors in L.A., myself, for the last 40 years, I hear every excuse why they fall apart. You know, traffic jam on the 10 freeway or the 405 or argument with their boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, agent, manager, um, classic, low blood sugar, didn't have enough breakfast or lunch. There's always an excuse. But if we blame externally, we're really missing, missing the point. He looked at himself, and he asked the question, he said, what am I doing that's causing the vocal loss? And the thing was, we're in 1890-something, uh, you know, there was no film to speak of, anything like that. So he couldn't really see himself, but he did ask family members, people in the acting companies, what did they observe? The picture came back a pretty stressful actor, a lot of neck-shoulder tension, went right down through his torso, even gripped the stage a little bit with his toes. But someone who was quite astute pointed out that he gasped air in on the phrase and pulled his head back slightly, sort of, <gasps> to be or not to be. <gasps> that is the question. Now, the truth is, inexperienced or young actors do that all the time, especially when the emotional level heightens. Uh, but if when I watch just ordinary people, if they're in a little upset moment talking to someone, you will see this. People pull down, sort of jut their head forward a little bit to make their point, and you'll see that little gasp coming in and a, a retraction of the head back and down. So he heard all this, and he got himself a mirror to see if he could see it, a single mirror, and uh, started talking, couldn't see a thing. But then he got the idea to project as if he was in front of a live audience. And the moment he got the idea to project, that pattern of interference popped forward. The leak, weak link became very evident when a demand was made on his instrument. Further examination showed it was actually there in ordinary conversation, like we're talking now, but it was very subtle, and he wasn't trained initially to see it. Now, this is the interesting part. He then went to problem solve the way you, Bob, and I are trained to problem solve. You know, it's called a Northern European approach to education. We have a difficulty because we don't have the right answer. So all we have to do through the process of accumulation is figure out the right way to do whatever we're not getting, a lot of new information, and then all we have to do is apply it and we'll be cool. This is pretty much how Alexander approached it. He studied different vocal techniques, different breathing techniques, different movement disciplines. Once he had accumulated a lot of new information in these areas, he went back on stage to implement them he lost his voice again. And that's when he had an insight. He saw the root of his problem was in his reaction. The moment he got the idea, even to walk on stage that say that line of Shakespeare, he was already pre-programming a whole set pattern of bad habits he didn't even know he had. This is the rock and the hard place because that means that whole process that you and I have to problem solve is actually uh, a fallacy. It won't get you what uh, you want. So the idea of knowledge only goes so far uh, absolutely. when you're Very reactive. Is, well, knowledge is always limited. No matter Information uh, is always limited. Um, it's one of the problems with our education today. It's information-based. You know, in college, university. I've been to far too many schools in my life. Um, it's not very practical. It might be interesting, but it doesn't really necessarily serve you in life. Um, it's, but the interesting point here is this transition Alexander made. At this moment, with the realization that his whole approach wasn't working, he still wished to act. 
So he asked a fundamental question. He said, okay, if a process of problem solving through accumulation isn't gaining the end I want, what is opposite? That's interesting reasoning it out in his thinking. And what he came to was that he needed to reapproach his vocal loss, problem solving through a process of negation, subtraction, and deconstruction, a process of taking away the unnecessary. Now, I introduce you to my, I call her my perpetual fiance, Carol, a little earlier, love her dearly. Um, and a few years back, I took her to uh, Tuscany. We were going to teach an Alexander workshop for a week. And then we went to Florence, and I wanted to show her Michelangelo's David. I'd seen it before. But it's an amazing, uh, needs to be on your bucket list, uh, bit of art. This magnificent statue of David. And uh, you go to the museum, you pay your money, you walk in, there's an archway. And you walk through the archway and you turn right and enter the long hallway is this huge statue. David had just slew Goliath. He's standing there, sort of a slingshot to his side. But, and you want to get a closer look. So you're walking down the hallway towards the statue. But on either side of you are incomplete statues that Michelangelo had started but never finished. And if you just reflect as for a moment and look at those statues, you will understand his whole creative process was one of subtracting the unnecessary marble. He didn't add on a flake. It was all taking away, not this, not that. And that's how the Alexander technique works. You learn to become aware without judgment or criticism, that's highly important, of your habits and the way you move, specifically in the way the head, neck, back works. And all vertebrate animals is a coordinating mechanism of head, neck, back relationship. So you learn to observe yourself in ordinary activity, sitting, standing, walking, picking things up. But how do you interfere? And then you learn how to let go of those, those patterns. That's, I mean, a technique, there's another level to it, but that is the real, at the beginning, the, how I teach it. You know, uh, you know, actor comes to me, he wants to be, you know, ace out the audition next week. But if, he, but if he, the way he uses himself is um, not very smart in the way he drives a car or talks to a friend or eats a meal, if all the habit patterns are there, they all carry over into the audition. Most people don't get that. It's the same nervous system. At the heart of it, you're changing people's lives, not just in the acting world, but in their well, daily, daily yeah. lives first. That's right. Uh, I mean... <laughs> I, you know, the, the great uh, Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh was asked the question, why do you wash dishes? And his answer was, I wash dishes to wash dishes. You know, the inference is there is that he doesn't wash dishes or want a way to do five cell phone calls. You know, he washes dishes. That is the present moment action. Yes. And that's what the technique teaches you to do. And that's why it's so valuable for actors, not only does it improve their voice and their, their stage presence, but it, it brings them into the present moment. Because the actors who are really interesting, if you even go back to people like Brando or in my generation, uh, Lee Marvin, you know, someone who was highly fascinating, Robert Mitchum. When they were into a room, that's the only place they were. There was something highly interesting just watching them. Now, it didn't mean that their lives were hunky-dory. Many of their lives were quite messed up. But that particular skill level and performance was there for them. The Alexander work has the benefit of teaching you the beginning steps how to do that, but it also helps you put your life in balance. Yeah, I was thinking about animals yeah. for, for a second. <coughs> Just I was thinking about like a dog never has to be, you know, told not to walk the way it's walking it just is born and it walks that way right it does on a horse or you know and, and, but humans we get socialized culturalized and i think and stress all, all yeah. those things are part of that and that's where the body become i guess out of alignment might that's be right you know out of alignment or in some way out of balance but the truth is animals also pick up humans bad habits one of my friends is an alexander teacher her husband plays polo. If you don't sit in the saddle right 
on the horse while playing polo, those, those polo ponies, as it were, uh, start to pick up patterns, actually, of misuse within themselves. So just because, you know, maybe the animal is born properly, you know, they're in interfacing with human beings, so things can happen. And it's the same thing with us. You know, I mean, I know if you and I were back, you know, five years old running around, we would be in pretty good shape. But then all the schooling and all the stuff starts accumulating in our life. When I think about a, a, a baby when it first starts to right. sit up, um, it's really, you know, can sit pretty straight. It has no difficulty. It's right. It's smiling. Right. And crawling, all those things that seem so natural and easy. And then you start to get, um, well, afraid or cautious or told to sit up straight, which is probably the worst <laughs> thing you can tell somebody. It seems yeah. like, like I hate it when people say, sit up straight. Yeah, that's right. Why? <laughs> I'm not right, comfortable. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, and then there's also what I, I guess it's referred to as the startle response. Well, this is important you brought that up because it really goes to what the essence of the Alexander work is. In your central nervous system and mine and, and the nervous system, anyone who's listening to this podcast, there's something called the fight-flight-freeze response. It's a very primitive reflex action that is actually a very positive thing. I could even make the statement that if you and I didn't have healthy fight-or-flight responses, we wouldn't be here today, and, and especially from a historical viewpoint. Our ancestors had to have good coordination to survive, you see. Now, there's another name for the fight-or-flight response. It's called the startle pattern that you just talked about. It's the same thing. The wind blows, the door slams, you and I jump. There's a third name. It's called stage fright. Stage fright is the fight-or-flight response, just from a performer's description. So going back to the beginning, F.M. Alexander, 24 years old, in Sydney and Melbourne, Australia, getting bigger and bigger roles. Now, I've observed, again, working with actors for many decades, that at the beginning of their career, a lot of times they ride on the good graces of natural talent. But at some point, if they're any good at all, they're given a bigger and bigger role, and at one moment they feel it's over their head to take on that role. And that's when they start to get stressed. And... Um, this is what happened with Alexander. He got a, a, you know, bigger roles, pr primarily playing Shakespeare. At one point, he had what I call that oh shit reaction, that tightening in his body, which actually put pressure on his breathing mechanism, which is primarily the ribs moving freely. And when there was a downward pressure by him pulling his head back and down and shortening and narrowing, that pressure undermined the foundation of his voice because it's the breath that gives foundation to the voice. And there, and then at that moment, he started pushing it, you see? And uh, that means he's probably straining a little bit in his vocal folds and his throat. And the outcome is he loses his voice. As long as he's in that patterning, no matter what he does, the outcome's going to be the same. He loses his voice. So what he was doing was internalizing the fight-or-flight response. There's nothing wrong with the fight-or-flight response. But you have to um, embody it and take it into action, fighting or running or being really quiet, you see. What we do today is we, to, we tend to cap the emotion. We internalize it, we fixate, and we, we keep it there. And then that contraction which at one level would have been useful, now becomes a problem. And uh, in Ale Alexander's case, he lost his, his voice. Sometimes people create so much tension in their bodies and their back starts to go out when they pick up the luggage and you know that sort of thing. So what you learn in this work is to how to observe yourself when the fight or flight has become fixed and then consciously learning how to release out of that pattern without any judgment of yourself, experimenting, exploring, being curious. So the techniques that you're teaching are a way to become conscious of what your habits are. 
Correct. And correcting them. Right. And the thing about it, I'm not sure how old you are. I'm going to be 75 at my next birthday. I am 65. Okay, 10 years difference. But that meant you and I grew up in an age that wasn't digitalized. Right. You know, when we went to play, we went outside and played. And then, mom, you know, it was pretty safe. I don't know. Yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. and then, you you know, you come in and, you know, you're there. And, and um, there wasn't the constant stimulation of having a computerized cell phone in your pocket. When I watch my students, the young students in their late teens and 20s and 30s, they're mesmerized by that phone. It's just one little step away from Pavlov's dogs. You know, the phone goes off, the beep goes off. Instead of salivating, they reach for their phone because the truth is there's actually an endorphin hit at that moment in their nervous system. There's some possible pleasure maybe coming from that incoming call. And uh, so people have a really hard time resisting that. Um, I know I do even. I, you know. Everyone that yeah. I talk to says this. Uh, right. this. This comes up in my podcast all, all the, the time. time. I sure it does. And, uh, and it's really sad. I have a daughter who's just turned 16 a week ago. She has, not, she has two computers and... A, a smartphone, you know, and she's wired to the hilt. And right now she's an A student, really bright. And luckily she has a parent who understands this. But um, uh, I look at her friends and they're all, their posture is, is really poor. Oh, it's the bent over looking oh, at yeah, it's, it's yeah, texting it's called, posture. Oh, yeah, it's called text neck. <laughs> you know what I mean? That <laughs> phrase is out there. Uh, and it's going to be a, a real I- health issue in the future. You're working with people, right. and, and they're they're doing some of these techniques, which are aligning the right. the head, neck, shoulders uh, properly. If I'm simplifying, probably. Um, do people have uh, emotional responses to this? Well, where where you see, you know, I know Mark said uh, uh, our mutual friend right. said that he is exhausted after a class. Well, Sometimes. that's only, yeah, that is something that could be typical at the beginning because you're moving from an old pattern into a new way of using yourself and new habits. Nothing wrong with habits, but you might as well create good ones. And you start moving into new patterns and new use, new, new uh, ease of movement. And sometimes that can be maybe a little exhausting or tired, but very quickly, I mean, Mark will find that he'll actually have more energy. Oh, okay. It's only in the transition time. When I trained as an Alexander teacher in London, it was a three-year Monday through Friday training. It was really extensive. And my wife at the time, who was training with me, we used to take the underground, the tube in London to go home. Inevitably, we would fall asleep on the tube. But after a while, after about six weeks of the training, pretty soon we were bright-eyed and just sharp, and that had gone. And this will happen with Mark and any of my other students. Oh, that's nice to hear. Not a big deal Mm -hmm. at all. Um, But what's more important, getting back, is this constant stimulation people are having today in the digital world. And we are not digital beings. We are analog beings with a mind that is so sharp it can create the digital world. But the digital world is only part of the picture. Artificial intelligence is artificial. It's an interesting thing that we're attracted to something with the name artificial. <laughs> well, right. It's, yeah, right. You want artificial food? Well, not actually, but I was reading about how people are developing proteins that we can feed, we can feed the human race that isn't um, either grown in the ground or born and running around. So. Or swimming. Yeah, I wish uh, you know maybe I could be around a you know, hundred years, which I won't be, but just to see where where the human race is going, that would be well, that's going to be so fascinating. Cause it it's, is, but it, I, I hope in a positive way. I me always, too. <laughs> I always have a a faith in in human beings, no matter what's happening, um, because the evolution of life on the planet. If you really step back and ask that question, what is the through line? What is the evolution of life on the planet? and it's become more self-aware. 
from the early amoeba, from the single cell. I mean, it's slowly become more and more aware. And here we are. We have the ability to actually watch the program. It's one of the things I teach Mark in, in, in the acting Alexander Technique class, that there's a distinction between thought and awareness. Thought is a tool, but thought is, thought is limited. It's time-bound. Uh, there's a past and future, a judgmental quality. Now, that's okay if I'm going to buy a shirt. I like this shirt better than that shirt. But when that judgmental thing slips into my opinions about you, then it gets to be an issue because it's all based so much on assumption. So that's where thought resides. But awareness is different. That's what Thich Nhat Hanh was talking about with washing dishes or wash dishes. You are actually there. And the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, the sense of touch, the kinesthetic sense, only happens in the present moment. There's no past or future to hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting. Uh, senses happen now. Thought is time-bound. Time travels. In a sense, you're getting humans to go back to being relaxed in a natural state, if there is such a thing, which I think there probably is, uh, Correct. relative to right. you know, socialization. But the, the, it's a technique to go back no, it's not in a what, sense. what it is. Yeah, you, to go back to maybe something natural, but Na but that all is within now. You see, the thing about it is that you're always going to lose balance and coordination. But if you have the art of regaining it, no matter what life hits you, then you can deal with it. So the key element is resilience picking yourself back up, not getting locked into faulty assumptions, mm -hmm. thinking, uh, judgmental behavior, uh, not getting self-critical. I mean, again, with performers, that's such a big one. They're, they're all so often self-critical, and I, I really get them away from that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, because when you're doing the th whatever it is, uh, whatever art form, and if you're self-critical, you're not in the thing. You're, well, that's right. So if you're in the thing, you can't, be, you can't do both. One of my children, um, he's no longer living. We don't need to go into this. Uh, but um, he was an incredibly successful artist. He was in London, Prince of Wales Institute of Architecture and so on, New Prince Charles. But the interesting thing about, about my son, when he was little, um, he was at an easel painting. And I happened to walk by him. And he said, uh, Dad? And I said, yes. His name was John Michael. I said, uh, he said, you know, sometimes when I paint, I just don't know what I'm painting. But then all of a sudden, there it is. Now, that is true creativity. You, you're going through the motions. You're painting the colors and the shapes and the vibrancy. But you're not quite, there's, you're not locked into an end result it pops out to you. All of a sudden, there it is. And I feel, I remember, I was watching a, f a film back in, in the early 60s of Jackson Pollock painting, and he, and he has this canvas on the floor, and he's um, uh, you know, putting the paint there, and you think it's, it's just helter-skelter, but it wasn't. He was doing what John Michael was doing, he was laying down the color. He was laying down a certain form. There was a certain impression of patterning. But then all of a sudden, there it was. That's how I think also any art form works. Acting, when you really talk with people who know what they're doing, it's learning how to be sensitive about what not to do mm. and really not acting. You know, you have the character that you're playing. There's the lines that are given. But you're not trying to do it. You're really, the, the, the technique, the skill level is, is one of being sensitive to, to what I don't want to do so that this other thing appears. I just remembered something from my childhood. Yeah? <laughs> I used to draw a lot when I was younger. I still draw, but this was a thing that I would, uh, no one in my family did this. Mm -hmm. It was just something I liked, I liked, and I would a lot of times I would copy the styles from uh, Mad Magazine. Sure. <laughs> I was really into Mad Magazine. And I don't know if this was a time I was doing that, but I had a notebook that I would draw in. 
And I remember one day I was at a table and it was real quiet in my house and I was drawing. And I was so in it. And I remember hearing my mother call my name and I was deep. I was deep mm -hmm. in it. And I, and I had this thought in my brain, which was, um, she's calling Bob. Uh -huh. I don't know who was saying that to me, but Bob, the character, the person that was being raised in this home was not the person that was drawing. Right. In, in, not like I was a crazy person, but it was that creative thing that had me. And I remember being really sort of irritated by being pulled out of it. I didn't like it, but it, it was it was so jarring. I, I could almost feel like a sound of like, like... I think that's the way it is. I mean, yeah, I remember hearing, uh, and it's, an, it's not an uncommon thing, but s I forgot who it was, some rock and roll star, some song that was famous, and, and uh, he or she was saying, it just came to me. I wrote it on that napkin, and, uh, and it flowed out. You see, it wasn't like he, th he or she thought about it. It was, uh, it was something that just, it almost uh, unfolded within them. Now, the same thing with writing a book. I was listening to a woman novelist, and she was uh, one of these, uh, again, I can't give you the name, but a, um, a very successful writer who had a series of books. And uh, the person interviewing her said, well, what in your current book that you're writing, where is it going to go? And she said, I don't know. I have to let the characters tell me as I'm writing. You know, she had discovered how to allow that creativity of the story to unfold within her without her, through her thought process, trying to plan it. And the, that's what you were. I mean, you were in that huh. moment of drawing. I mean, it wasn't that you weren't little Bob and mom was caught. You know, you got it. But, it, the, but you weren't doing it linearly, uh, in a linear fashion. I mean, the older I get, the more I think that that's, I don't, th life's not linear. I, I feel that um, it unfolds in a certain way. And if you're fortunate enough to get out of the way so that the patterning that exists unfolds, then that's the good. I mean, uh, I, he I remember hearing Paul McCartney talk about the Beatles, and he made the comment that in 1960-ish, there were a lot of great bands around Liverpool and, and around England in general. And he was just one of them, the Beatles were. Um, and then, uh, then he said, it was if the zeitgeist of the moment picked us up and we were carried through the wave of the 60s. It's mm -hmm. kind of amazing because all four of them were just um, whatever was going on there, right. that unit was... It able just to to tap uh, into that as a unit, it, right? which is uh, you know probably speaks a lot to their friendship and their musical and also to the journey. good fortune that they were at the right time at the right well, place that too. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so. always nice, right? Right. Now I was telling um, I was telling uh, uh, Carol uh, before you walked in that I when I did the Alexander uh, work um, that the reason I started it was I was having back pain. Sure. And one of the things I discovered, and I'm just saying this because maybe people will notice it in themselves, is that I was locking my knees. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, the uh, my instructor saying, you bend your knees a little bit. And I said, but I won't be as tall. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> that's goes, it. You know, yeah. you know, someone made a comment that Bob isn't tall as a young yeah. man. And you thought, well, I want to be taller. And then you sort of. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> and then she said, you'll, you'll be taller. I go, how right. is that possible if my knees are bent? I got mad, you know. Right. And she goes, you will be because the way you're standing now is, is locked and your, right. your lower back is forward. So you're okay. losing height there and now your shoulders are tight yeah she's right and your teacher was correct yeah well because you taught her <laughs> oh well okay fair <laughs> enough <laughs> thank you i think you did right didn't you tell me that i'm, I'm trying i don't remember her name oh her name is amy fleetman oh yeah yeah you yeah, told amy, me that she yeah, studied no, with she, you yeah, yeah sure did at, at and she was yeah alexander technique institute in los angeles in yeah. santa monica so she yeah. was she was wonderful and you know she taught me Right. A lot of a lot of stuff, right. and um, it's a long time since I've seen her. But, yeah, um, me too. But no, that's right. I mean, you know, I mean, someone might get locked in 
to trying to fix the knees and forget about everything else. But that's one of the uh, things about the Alexander work is that we look at the overall patterning of the way the head, neck, and back work. So if a person comes in and complains about their ankle or hips or knees or lower back, I'm aware of that and I'm sensitive to what they're describing, but I always sort out the, uh, the, this coordinating patterning of the head, neck, back. When you were talking about the ribs earlier, right? many years ago I went and did about uh, eight or ten, somewhere in there, sessions uh, doing uh, body work called rolfing. Right. And one of the days I went in there, he uh, worked on the, I guess it's muscles between the ribs, mm-hmm. with his elbow. And um, when I walked out of there, I could breathe in a way that I hadn't breathed since I was a little child. I mean, it was so tight between those ribs uh, from you know, what you were talking about earlier. I'm sure it's part of that that stress situation. I couldn't believe it. I felt like my my ribs and my lungs were twice as big. I'm not kidding you. No, and, I understand and, and the that. Energy and the right. thought power was was increased because of the so, oxygen. Absolutely. I mean, I have some experience with rolfing, and um, you know that's all good, and I and I have respect for it. The area that I cover is that you can have that experience, which is completely valid, having that rolfing session with your breath freeing up. But unless you change your habit pattern in life, eventually the tension is going to come back some way. Maybe slightly different configuration, but it'll be there. Yes. So what is good about the Alexander work is learning how to re-pattern the whole system in a way where, as I said earlier, you're always going to lose it, but if you know the art of regaining it, what you're regaining isn't a feeling. You're regaining a delicate movement pattern. Feelings come about after you move. So um, that, that is really an important thing. A lot of times people get hooked into the feeling of something, some yeah. type of therapy. But well, that is simply it, a yeah. release that's come about because of the therapy or the skill of the therapist. The thing uh, that you want to do is... Um, don't go for the feeling. Go for the change of the patterning. That's different. What's the time period where you start to see people really changing? I know it varies, obviously, be depending on the person and how hard they work and right, sure. what their situation is. But when do people usually say, oh, my gosh, things have really changed? Well, <laughs> I mean, it... Not a valid question, possibly. Well, it's a hard <laughs> question because it's all person-specific. The way I sort of answer that sort of thing generally is that in studying with me, whether individual lessons, you know, coaching individual lessons or small group classes, you learn something of valid from the very Mm get-go. It is not sort of you accumulate and after 10 or 20 lessons a penny drops and you get it. It's it's like learning a foreign language. You know, in that first uh, classes in French or German or Spanish, maybe you learn how to ask the waiter for a check and where's the bathroom and right and left. But that's the beginning. And then it grows. And it's the same thing with the Alexander technique. You learn something that is useful from the get-go. And if that is of interest to you to continue, then you build on that. I just taught uh, um, probably, I don't know how many actors yesterday morning, maybe around 15. This was, I think, their fifth group class. One of the actors said to me, you know, people are noticing that I'm changing. And he felt really good about that. Uh, It wasn't like they go up to you and say, hey, you must be doing the Alexander (laughs) technique. I mean, that's almost a failure sign. But if they say things, you know, you look easier or you look a little taller or you, you you know, you're a little bit more graceful or I love your voice. Have you been doing voice work? You know, something like that. Then, then they start to understand that change is occurring. And the ones who really like that stick with it. And then maybe they end up being an Alexander teacher like me. Yes. <laughs> that, well, that's, right. that's a good service to, well, to, to people. You know, I got into this work because I was 
I always describe myself as the best trained non-actor you'll ever meet because I have a degree in theater and and I was an apprentice actor at the Trone Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis in the late uh, 60s. And then through the Guthrie, I was sent to the Bristol Old Vic Theater School in Bristol, England. So I trained further as an actor there. But I never really liked it. Um, and I had a hard time with memorization because I'm dyslexic. Mm. So I didn't have the Alexander Technique as a tool. So that fear wrapped around the dyslexic and uh, dyslexia, uh, uh, you know, that problem of memorizing. I didn't quite have the right tools to deal with it. Then I stumbled onto the Alexander Technique, and uh, it changed my life. I just love when I hear somebody having a liability, supposedly liability, like the dyslexia, leading them to their life's purpose. Well, yeah. Quite beautiful, (laughs) I have to say. Well, no, it's true. I mean... The thing about acting, I mean, the m- first of all, I got into it. I was 17 at university, and I wasn't any good at sports. And I, w- I wandered into a drama class one time, and I noticed the girls were beautiful, and there were always more women than men, and half the guys were gay. And uh, so I figured I had a shot. Good odds. Yeah, and, and then I was lucky. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd get roles, but I'd always want the little role. But I remember... Uh, at Northern Illinois University, I got the lead in a play, and it scared me so much I never went back. But if I knew what I knew now, that's the thing. If I knew how I knew what I know now back then, I would know how to deal with it. I could make a conscious choice, either to do it or not to do it, but I wouldn't make the choice out of fear. And if I chose to do it, I would have the tools now to augment the dyslexia, and to help myself memorize. Because the interesting thing is this. if When I would have a fear pattern back when I was young uh, at learning a big text, I inevitably, even though I didn't know the Alexander technique, I inevitably was tightening my head, neck, and back as I was memorizing. It was like, oh, shit, look at these lines. Look, at I've got this big speech. And there'd be tension And what happens is that when the actor memorizes text, he or she is also memorizing the psychophysical patterning of their body as they memorize the text. I didn't know this. What that meant is that then when I went to be on stage or in front of a camera, I would be um, not only recalling the lines, but I'd be recalling a whole set pattern of interference in the way my movement was and the way my voice was working and everything. Yeah, so there's a mind-body connection there. Yeah, the Alexander Technique is called psychophysical re-education, mind-body learning. He was, uh, F.M. Alexander was the first person to, uh, in the Western world, to use psychophysical. That's amazing that he was 24 and he just started figuring this stuff out. Well, you know, again, he was originally from Tasmania, And he had a mother who was very strong-willed and was a midwife. And if you're talking, you know, the 1870s, when he was a young boy, um, you know, his impression, his mother, if there was a woman going into labor at at some farm nearby, she'd get on the horse, jump the fence, and ride off and help. And he was a very, from what I said, I never met the man, he died in 55, but um, he was a sickly child, and his mother basically willed him to good health through taking care of him. So he had this stick to in him, and he also had that pioneer spirit that came out of the second half of the 1800s. He was a type of person who, if he wished to try to learn something or do something, he tackled it. So the same thing with his voice issue. Sometimes I half-jokingly say that if F.M. Alexander was born today, was an actor with a vocal problem, he would have never discovered the Alexander principles. What he would have done is gone to a doctor, he'd got some type of special drug or medication or a beta blocker of some sort uh, to (laughs) deal with his nerves, and his voice would have been there, but it wouldn't have been like what it was whenever he took responsibility himself. A number of years ago when I was having these back issues, which I don't Mm. have now, that it was um, stress-related. 
Hmm. And I'm like, you're telling me my back, quote, <laughs> goes out <laughs> right. because of stress. So they gave me a book called uh, Mind Over Back Pain by John Sarno. Have you ever read Right. No, I know the book. I he, might even own it some Yeah, it's a tremendous that. book. Right. And then there's Overcoming Back Pain. There's two, a couple of them. And he said the same thing. So I'm reading this book, and I'm like, this is bullshit. I, <laughs> this. So about two weeks later, I'm doing the strenuous activity of folding socks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking about something and I don't remember what it was, unpleasant. And literally as I'm folding socks, my back tweaks and goes out. P- big pain. Yeah. And I went it happened right there. I was like, "Oh my god, this is true. That's I right. thought myself into this thing." Right, because thinking is never just I mean, in, in the mind. I mean, it it has an effect on the overall system. Oh, I, I was shocked. And, sure. And I went, oh, so if, and I kind of did this backwards thing. I went, well, if my mind caused it, then my mind can uncause it, mm-hmm. or at least not cause it again. Well, that's what Alexander did. He reasoned it out. I mean, the the right use of of our thinking process, the cerebral cortex, and what we have as a human being, is to reason things out. And then, as I said earlier in this podcast, ask the question, what is it I don't need to do? I mean, I'll give a real practical thing before I ever had Alexander lessons. I, I used to have migraine headaches from the age of about 11 until I, shortly after I turned 60, 61. They'd happen every month, and they were really, really bad. I'd be, I mean, the pain was so severe. But one time, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, You know, 1966, I'm going up to party that weekend. I have such a severe migraine. I'm staying with some guy friends, and I say to them, I'm just not well, and I need to go into the bedroom and just turn the lights out. Don't play loud music. Please leave me alone. And I went there, and I tried all the tricks to get over the migraine. You know, rocking, humming, um, drinking lots of water, uh, even throwing up, you know, all these things to try to relieve because the pain was, I mean, if you've ever, migraine headaches are a bit like eating ice cream and having a brain freeze because of the ice cream, but it doesn't go away. Mm. And I've the, never had that, but oh, I know people that yeah. do, and they see like a white light. Oh, yeah, all that. You get aurora and, borealis, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. So anyway, I was in bad shape. So I asked myself, what's the one thing I haven't done? And what I saw was up to that moment, my whole process, my whole being was running away from the pain inside. I wanted to get away from that pain. So the one thing I hadn't done was to stop and turn and face it. So I figured I've tried everything else and I'm really desperate. So I just sat quietly and I stopped inside and I literally turned my attention and faced the pain. I swear to you, it lessened by about 40%. Now, I still had a migraine, but 40% reduction was enough for me to get a handle on it. Changed my life. This idea of, of staying with it, of being with it, of not even judging it as a problem. When I'm running away from it, it's a problem. It's dangerous. It's something that's hurting me. I turn and face it. I accept it. I enter into it. And uh, it had a profound effect. Again, going back to fear, of owning the fear and turning and facing it. Mm -hmm. I always say to the young actors, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Living in England in the 70s, I saw all the great actors live. Ralph Richardson, John Gielgud, Laurence Olivier, Alan Bates, Peggy Ashcroft, all these great actors. And the most exciting was a man named Paul Schofield. He was dangerous on stage. You watched him, and he, you were on the edge of your seat. I'd go back two or three times to see the same performance, and you, you had the same effect each time. Now, you knew he was a consummate actor, that he had learned his lines cold. I mean, the guy had a stel. He won an Oscar for, is it Lion in Winter or Beckett? One of those movies. I can't remember exactly. And one time I met an actor who was in a, play with him. It was it was The Tempest by Shakespeare and Paul Schofield is playing Prospero. So I asked the actor, what is his process? 
why is he so dangerous on stage? And the actor said, well, it's this way. There are two doors in front of Paul Schofield. The door on the right, if he walks th through that door, it's where everyone pats him on the back and says what a great actor he is. And, you know, he has all the skill level there and, and, and uh, all the acclaim comes his way. But he said he doesn't walk through that door. He walks through that door on the left, the door most people avoid. And in that door, when you walk through it, all the fears, all the concerns, all the self-doubt, all of that is there. And when Schofield enters into that, that's what makes him dangerous. Now that's PhD acting, and I tell you, very few actors ever do that. And the Alexander Technique can help you, if you're a performer, enter into that world. Because it gives you a tool as you walk through that door, instead of locking into the fear reaction, you create a space between the reaction and you. We have a word for that. It's called inhibition. And we don't mean in the definition of Sigmund Freud, which is a repression. We don't mean that at all. So you can put that to the side. But a completely different definition of inhibition is a neurological one, is saying no to a stimulus. Now, we all know what that is. You know, when you and I were little boys, someone taught us to cross the road. And what they did is they took our hand at the curb and they said, Mike, Bob, I know you really want to go to that birthday party across the street, but we just can't dash into the street. You could get really hurt. We need to stop, look, and listen. And when the coast is clear, we'll go across to the party. That's teaching a child conscious inhibition. And that's what the Alexander Technique is. If, if you're fortunate enough as a performer, actor, musician, singer, what, whatever the, it is, you can choose that second door on the left to walk through. But if you know how to come back to an internal length and width, then that fear is not going to control you. But it also happens that way in life doesn't have to be a performer. It can be in relationship with your husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, someone at work. That was going to be my next uh -huh. question, actually. Okay. You just answered it. Yeah. yeah. That we can use these oh, yeah. techniques yeah. For, for bettering our daily Oh, yeah. Uh, the person who trained me to be an Alexander teacher was a couple in London named Walter and Dillis Carrington. They were, I was so fortunate. They were master teachers. They had trained in the 30s. Uh, he, uh, he trained, Walter Carrington trained in the 30s before World War II with F.M. Alexander. And Dillis, his wife, trained from the 30s into the 40s. <laughs> what um, Walter said, he said, you know, the Alexander technique is dead menial. And I was a little taken back by that. I said, what do you mean, Walter? And he said, it's ordinary. It makes the ordinary extraordinary. Because you can learn how to cut up the carrots in the kitchen, how to drive your car, how to read the paper, how to be at the computer with a little bit more ease of movement. Now, if that also happens to help you as you play saxophone in a jazz group or you're a singer or a dancer or an actor or uh, uh, someone in, in uh, management, upper-level management who has to give a presentation, well, good. But for the ordinary person, it just makes things a little bit easier. And that's the key. I mean, why hit your head against the wall because of habit patterns that are sort of tail wagging the dog? Why not learn without criticism how to observe what you're doing? Create that little space between the stimulus and response. You're just not doing knee-jerk reactions your whole life. And um, move forward. I always think about stimulus and reaction and that space in between. If I can live in there... Uh, right. Uh, it's, it's, you know. Right. Uh, what's uh, Eckhart Tolle says? Uh, unconsciousness equals reactivity. Reactivity equals unconsciousness. So it's really about becoming more conscious. Correct. Conscious. More conscious. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's what I said at the beginning of this podcast, that the evolution of life has become more self-aware. That is an unbelievably good ending. Well, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we didn't plan this, so no. it just unfolded to this. Uh, so. But we're not quite done because oh, I, wa- okay. I want people to know where they can uh, learn more about Alexander and find you. I'll do a little plug. Um, sure, do I've that. been I've been running uh, residential workshops in the Alexander Technique. This is the 40th anniversary year, and we do one in Malibu. Uh, at the Sarah Retreat Center, a very beautiful location. I've been there. It's beautiful. Yeah, magical place. And uh, it's always the same time, December 27th to January 1st, over that period of time. It's residential. You have great food, a great place to stay. stay. And um, I bring together a teaching staff of 7 to 10 people who are the best teachers in the world, actually. And so it's, um, and we usually get 30 to 40 people. Um, it's a lot of fun. So we, we really blend uh, learning with, with uh, the joy of learning. You see. I, and, and they can find it. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. Um, uh, if they go to the website, alexandertechniqueretreats.com or alexandertechniqueworkshops.com. They both l- lead to the same place. They can, my personal website, Michael D, with a D, michaeldfrederick.com. Or they can just email me, michaelfrederick123 at gmail. <laughs> it's just F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, that. F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, <laughs> Michael Frederick. It's just that easy, one, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. I really appreciate you uh, talking to me today. No, it's this been is, great fun. Yeah, I had a great drive up in the <laughs> rain to Ojai. I've yeah, never been it, to Ojai. Right, Ojai, I, I was saying to Carol earlier, it's too bad you guys came up. I mean, I'm thrilled it's raining because of Southern California yeah, and the I, drought. I like the rain. But Ojai usually is sunny and magnificent, so it's still worth a drive around a little bit later. Well, I'll come back. Right. How about and that? And for those of you who don't know where Ojai is, it's about 80 miles, 75 to 80 miles north of uh, Los Angeles. You, hit, you come up the 101 to Ventura, Highway 33 inland, about 20 minutes you're in the Ojai Valley. Yeah, and we took the uh, PCH up. Right, you can take PCH, yeah, all the way up. PCH comes up to Rice Road. You take that into the 101 and just come up to Ventura on Highway 33. It's a great ride and, a, and a, a great landing. When Capra made the movie Lost Horizons, he used Ojai as the model for Tibet. Oh, because he put a camera in the upper Ojai Mountain and filmed across the valley. And, if, and you lose perspective, so you think the mountains are like five times taller than they are. And that's uh, back in the 30s. He used this as, a, as Shangri-La. Oh, okay. So well, I guess then it is. It is. Yeah. So. Well, thanks a lot, and I sure. uh, hope we can talk again. I look forward to it. All right, thanks. Big thanks to Michael Frederick. Really enjoyed talking to him. And we have uh, planned to meet up again and talk about some other things that we discovered after we did the podcast. So uh, I'll let you know when that's coming, or I won't. You'll just have to listen in. But he's coming back, and uh, I look forward to talking to him again. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it.